Welcome everyone to Grace Wrestling tonight. Oh, we're so excited to be here. You excited to be in the house of God tonight? Anyone excited here to be in the house of God tonight? We're excited. Let's worship together. Can we stand if you can? And let's worship in a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Holy, holy. My name is Pastor Myron, and I'd like to welcome you to the Saturday night service of Grace Wesley in Fort Lauderdale. 
For we're a welcoming community of believers sharing Christ's love, grace, and redemption with all. Um, when, fellas, when you came in, were you given a handout? Patrick was trying to catch every man that came in the door. This is for April 27th. It's Saturday morning. We're going to have our next men's prayer breakfast. And fellas, put this on your calendar. Uh, uh, come down and, and commune with us. Bring a friend. We typically have five to six different churches represented here on that those Saturday mornings. It's, it's good fellowship and it's good food. Uh, uh, is Brian helping cook again? Yes, he will both. We're in for a treat then. Brian's helping Patrick and Donna cook, so we're going to have good food. So uh, mark that on your calendars. This week coming up, Monday night, we have the men and ladies on Monday night. Tuesday night, the pastor's Bible study resumes. And Thursday night, we were going to have the council meeting, but uh, the, we put the council meeting off a week because a significant number of the council members are going to be at the walk to Emmaus beginning Thursday, so we're moving it one week. So the council meeting will actually be the following week on the 18th. And that means we won't have the, that next session of the uh, Wesley Bible study. We'll move it off till the first week in May. So just so you know what's happening with all that. Friends, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day where we can come to your house and worship you, Lord. And we know the Holy Spirit is in your house here. And we ask the Spirit come into each of us. Lord, enliven our hearts and our minds to the messages you have for us. And as Freddie and the guys lead us in music, Lord, hear our hearts as we sing praises to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, friends, please stand as you are able and join me as we state our beliefs and connect ourselves with Christians from the first century to today and all Christians in future times by stating the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen. Let us state our beliefs. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing the song, Holy King Forever.
our banner high. God, we just thank you for everything you do. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these seats. Thank you for these walls. Thank you for these instruments. Thank you for providing, oh God. We give you so much thanks. We're so grateful. We enter into this place just giving you thanks for everything you do. Thank you that we get to wake up today and breathe. Thank you, God. Thank you for another day, another day to worship you. We're so grateful. We're so grateful. All my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must stay, but you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I Hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got a warm response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you.
want to interject something real quick. So this this past uh, this Easter Sunday, my son, uh, he got to play Jesus. And uh, they did at my dad's church, they did like a walkthrough where people would just walk through and you had the different stations. You know, you had the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, you had uh, the Last Supper, you had the crucifixion, you had the resurrection. Well, my son, they chose him for Jesus. Uh, I guess because he's so good looking like his dad, but maybe... Uh, so then, he was. The interesting thing about this walkthrough is that a lot of people going through. So he had to he had to do this one scene on the cross. So he, he didn't have a shirt. He got all the scars up, and he was holding his hands up on the cross. And he did it like twenty three times, because as a walkthrough, as you as you well know, walkthrough is just people just coming groups of people every time. So he was he would cr- get on the cross, and he would say. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he would, you know, and he would shout out, and and then they would get him off the cross and take him away, right? He did that 23 times. And I asked my son at the end, and I, I, as, a, as a proud father, I, you know, I saw all 23, right? He's a proud dad, like, <laughs> my son doing the same thing. But I was, like, looking at him, and then I asked him after. First, I was very teary, and I was very emotional because just see my son, playing Jesus. And I asked him, Bobby, were you, were you tired? That's 23 times, man. Were you, were you tired of doing the throw? He goes, no, you know what, Dad? I learned that if Jesus was able to do that for me, and what was powerful for me is that I wasn't complaining because I was, I put myself in Jesus' shoes just for those seconds, which is nothing compared to what Jesus went through. And that's why it was so powerful when he had his hands raised. That's why I think it's so powerful when we raise our hands. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing, hallelujah, yeah, hallelujah. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and parade. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul, so come on, my soul. the world 
bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? We say Friends, let's pray for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to be with you. We thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, all we have for you is a hallelujah and these humble gifts. And we ask that you accept these gifts, Lord. Bless the givers and bless the gifts, please. 
send your spirit to guide their use so they're used according to your will. And may the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name. Greetings. You know, we're in Easter. We're in Easter. The, the 50 days, the 7 weeks, 49 days between Easter and Pentecost are all Easter. All those weeks are Easter. It's not first week, second week, third week after Easter. No. It, this is the second weekend of Easter. We're still celebrating Easter. We will be celebrating Easter until Pentecost. So every week when we come here for the next five after this, it's going to be all about celebrating Easter. And so in that vein, it's, it's, it's a little challenging for us because like last week we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, right? Resurrection Day. Tonight, we are that evening. In the scripture, the lesson for tonight, we are that evening. For us, it's been a week. We've gone about our affairs. We've gone to our jobs. We've gone shopping. We've slept a time or two. We've done everything that we normally do during the course of a week. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, it's been a day, and what a day it's been. Because last week, the way Mark told it was Mary and Mary and Salome went to the tomb, found it open, and they were terrified and ran off. Didn't want to tell anybody because they were afraid. Now, this week, we have John telling us what happened that evening. But let's just think about it for a second before we get to the reading. What was that day like, probably? Because we know from the other Gospels, you know, Peter and John, or just Peter, or what, depending on how you, uh, which version your, your comes, first comes to mind, they ran to the tomb, saw it empty. And then we know the disciples went back to their safe place. What kind of conversation do you think they were having? Because, you know, on Saturday... They probably had conversations like, we followed him for three years. We just knew he was the Messiah, but it doesn't make any sense the Messiah was, would die. I know he told us everything he said come true, but did he really have to die? That, that doesn't fit our understanding. And so we were living a promise. For three years we lived a promise of what Jesus was going to do. And he's dead. What does that do to the promise? What does that do to what we thought was going to happen? And the next day, today, the tomb's empty. I can only imagine the conversations they're having, but, and none of them were probably that pleasant. They're all wondering, what in the world, what in the world, what in the world, what does this mean? Because I'm sure there was a lot of, woe is us? What do we do now? Now what? Then what? So let's read John and see what. So we're reading in John tonight. We're going to read out of John chapter 20. We're going to pick up in verse 19. So let's hear. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my, to my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. Okay. So they're up there in the upper room, having whatever kind of conversation they're having. The doors are locked for fear of the Jews. Now, if they were in the upper room like we thought, the odds are there was an outer door to the house that probably was bolted, and presumably the, the door to the room was bolted too, so it was double locked. Well, there's one or two. The point is they were in the room locked because they were scared. They thought if they were found out, then they would be next. They didn't know how far this persecution of Jesus was going to go. I mean, after all, Peter was accused there in the courtyard, right? He didn't know what was going to happen while Jesus was on trial, so they were all scared. We know how scared they were because they all disappeared from the garden when the temple guards came with Judas and they arrested Jesus. They all ran, all of them. And then Peter denied him. So there they were, and Jesus came in to the room. The door's locked. It's important. First thing he said is, peace be with you, because he knew they were freaking out. Because he appeared, right? When angels or deities appeared in Scripture, anytime they appeared in Scripture, the first thing was, do not be afraid. But in Jesus' case, he said, peace be with you. Y'all be calm. And then he said it again. The second time, it didn't have the same meaning as the first time. See, the first time was peace be with you, the regular greeting. It was a regular greeting. Salam alaikum. It was a regular greeting. Okay? Now this time, though, this time it was peace into your hearts. Because he knew their hearts were going nine into nothing at this moment because they saw Jesus. Whatever they were experiencing before, now it's compounded in a way because Jesus is there. Think, if any of them had any regrets that they abandoned him on Friday, and that was part of the conversation today, and then there Jesus is, that conversation about, I wonder if we should have stayed and protected him. I wonder if we should have fought off those temple guards. What if? What if we hadn't ran? And then Jesus says, Peace be with you that second time. He was speaking into their hearts to tell them, y'all be cool. Because I know what's going on inside of you. Y'all are stressed to the max. You're afraid of getting picked up by the Jews. Now you're afraid what I'm going to think and say to you because you abandoned me. Peace be with you. And see, when Jesus told them this before, once before, he said, I give to you my peace. And I don't give as the world gives. Jesus told them he was giving them spiritual peace, a different kind of peace than what they knew in the worldly sense. I mean, for us, peace is like no fighting. Things were calm. Spiritual peace, though, is something totally different. The spiritual peace allows you to face those headwinds, to face those trials, those crucibles, those hard parts of life that you can face those and still remain calm. It's a different kind of peace. It's a peace that dwells in you that can't be disturbed if it's a spiritual peace. That's what Jesus has given to them this second time. Peace be with you. And he tells them, look, feel my hands. Feel my side. It's me. And they were relieved. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glad you're here. Oh, my gosh. And they were fellowshipping. Everybody was happy. And then Jesus tells them, as my Father sent me, I am sending you. In that moment, friends, they went from disciples to apostles. Disciples are followers. Apostles are leaders. Apostles are sent to go do a job. The disciples follow the leader. God sent Jesus to the world, so he, he was the first apostle was Jesus. The great apostle was Jesus. Now Jesus made his 12, the, well, the 11 now, the, those disciples, apostles, because he's sending them. And then he breathed 
onto them. He says he breathed the Spirit onto them. This was kind of a preparatory for them to receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. This was something to kind of bridge them from where they were to get them to Pentecost. Because he knew they still needed something to get out of that room. They needed to go and share that they saw Jesus. They needed to go and share what they heard from Jesus. They needed to go share what they saw Jesus do. They needed to go share the good news of what Jesus came for. Not stay locked up in that room. Then we get to the part that's probably the most famous, uh, the most famous thing that any disciple did. It, it certainly had countless hours of, of theological work and application and attention to it, and that's the Doubting Thomas part. See, uh, uh, I, I read this week that Doubting Thomas is probably the most familiar action and name for a disciple that any people have. We know Peter and James and John and all that. We know all those. But doubting Thomas is like right up there with him. We know Thomas, right, because of that. So why does Thomas resonate so much? It's not just because he said, I'm not going to believe it. It's because Thomas represents each of us at one time or another. Because see, each of us at one time or another, we have our doubts. And here's a, a, a funny little bit for you. In the early church, they doubted, those that doubted, they doubted, can God really die? This is before the Nicene Creed. This is before they got together and made the creedal statements that Jesus was God and he was crucified and resurrected. Okay? But the question, the doubt of the day was, can God really die? Can you kill God? That was the first major ongoing doubt thing. That went on for 100 or 200 years until they got to the creeds. Then in medieval times when they had the scholastics, the Thomas Aquinas and those guys, then they got into an analytical thing about trying to analyze, is it really possible to come back from death? Is the resurrection really possible? It was a different kind of doubt. It was analytical. Because humans are smarter then. That's what the scholastic movement was about. Also during that time there was a mysticism movement in which people, the, the people that were in monasteries and uh, the, the, the places where the nuns were too. And they, there's mysticism uh, uh, where they, people tried really hard to experience the presence of God through the Spirit. And for them, this doubting part was called the dark night of the soul. Okay, it's when, when you question about what Jesus did. Could he really die and be resurrected? These kind of doubts. It's the dark night of the soul. And during that time, they believed that your faith would germinate and start to grow in that dark part of your soul. And when it's dark, and it would grow and become light, and then your soul would be enlightened with the truth. Then you get to the enlightenment itself. and Oh boy, now here we go. This is the part where humans get really dumb. Because they were questioning about, you know, the, the, not only just the resurrection part, but the whole God thing. You remember, if you can't t touch it, see it, feel it, or put it in a Bunsen burner or something, can it be real? And so they were questioning all these other things about God. And curiously enough, these seasons that went on the last 2,000 years of these different sort of, sort of categories of doubt, they kind of correspond with the human existence. Let me tell you what I mean. Youngsters, teenagers, college students, they have doubts like the first early Christians did. Can God really die? And if he died, is he really God? They have those fundamental kind of doubts. And then as you get a little older, you start to become more analytical. And you have the kind of doubts that go with adulthood. About, can God really come back to life from resurrection? Can dead people really come back to life? That hasn't been my experience. And this is common with the late 20, 30-somethings. Then you get to the, uh, the, the, mystic, mystic, the, the mysticism part as you start going through crucibles in life, right? 
You lose a loved one, you lose a parent, a sibling, go through a divorce, get cancer, injured in a, some kind of industrial accident or something. Something significant happens. Now all of a sudden, you're not really doubting so much that God's there, but you're wondering how you might experience Him better. Prove to me you're there, God. Let me experience you. So we step a little into the mysticism part of our faith. Because a complete faith has components of that. And if you look back on your life, you probably wove through some of these little seasons in your life. For some people, they're more compacted together. For others, they're drug out. And for others of us, they haven't been through all of them yet. Maybe just some of them. But the point here is that Thomas, being the doubting guy, is somebody that Christians through all the last 2,000 years can relate to in one level or another. Of all the disciples, he's the one we can most relate to because we know a time when we doubted. Maybe there's times yesterday or today or last week or last month that you doubted something. You don't talk about it. You don't admit it. But for a little bit there, you kind of did. Like when the doctor told you you had cancer, you doubted for a little minute. Why would God let me have cancer if he loves me? These kind of questions are real. They happen. As a pastor, I've heard them. But we all relate to that. And it's not about Thomas's doubting. There's been so much talked about Thomas doubting, Thomas doubting. We need to just clear up what the connection is between us and Thomas and the doubting. And that is that we relate to him because all of us at times have those. But that's not really what this story's about. It's not really what this scripture's about. This scripture's about locked doors. Us being in closed off spaces. Us thinking we're someplace where we can lock things up and we're safe in this space we created. What's well, behind one locked door, two locked doors, in the safety of our car, in our house, on a vacation, wherever we think is safe. Jesus shows up. You can't lock him out. You can't build a wall to keep him out. There's nothing you can do to keep Jesus away. This story is about Jesus coming to his own. This story is about Jesus coming to us. Last week we talked about Jesus going ahead and meeting us at our Galilee. This week it's about Jesus coming to where we are when we think for some reason we're scared, we're afraid of the Jews, we don't want to get found out, whatever the case may be. We go and lock ourselves off from what we're afraid of. And Jesus shows up. He comes through the barriers we create, whatever they are, to stand beside us and tell us, I'm here. I am who I said I am. And I'm sending you like my Father sent me. I'm here to give you what you need to go do what God set in front of you to do. And He breathes into our hearts the encouragement in the scripture he breathed on to his disciples and said receive the holy spirit it's interesting when god breathed life into adam he breathed into adam when jesus breathed on the disciples of Israel, he breathed onto them there's a little difference between in to and on what jesus gave them tonight and what he gives us each and every day is that wind in our sails well, it gives us what we need to take that next step. As Fred and I call it, the next right thing. You know, we may not know the exact path God has for us. It's, it's hard to imagine that for us. Some days I'm doing the best I can just to get from here to lunch. I can't begin to know what God's planning for me, right? But one thing I can nearly always do is tell you what the next right thing for me is. I can look and see what my options are right there in front of me. And I can tell you which one stands out as the next right thing. Nearly always I can do that. I think we all can. And see, following God is a matter of being in prayer, worshiping and doing all the things we do to exercise our means of grace. But then we look and we see what's the next right thing. If I'm asking God what's the next right thing, and it's obvious because it nearly always is, we go do that next right thing. And God takes us from one to the next, to the next, to the next. That's how we've tried to 
grow and lead this church is just by doing the next right thing. We don't have to pretend to have all the answers about how we should do everything. We're plenty willing to receive the new ideas and the right ideas and stuff. The thing is, we just want to do the next right thing. And if we make a mistake, we acknowledge it, back up if we need to, and then go the other way. That's what we do. But that's what we do as Christians following Jesus anyway. The disciples abandoned Jesus. They didn't do the next right thing. They did for the sake of their human safety in that moment, the selfish right thing. They did what they needed to do, did what Jesus knew they were going to do. So he came back to them, peace be with you. I got y'all. Y'all calm down. It's okay. I'm sending you. And then he tells them something that's been abused, misused, misunderstood for centuries. If you forgive anybody, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're unforgiven. Sounds an awful lot like we ought to be judges, huh? That's not what that was about. In, the, the, in Matthew, there's a parallel to this. It's called loosening and binding. We talked about that before. In the Old Testament tradition, the loosening and binding is what the rabbis would do or the judges would do about loosening or binding the consequence to a, a breaking one of the laws. You broke a law, they would loosen where you, you were out from under the penalty either because you got cleansed or you were bound to it and you had to go get cleansed or get right or have the consequence or whatever. But in the context of when the Gospel of John was written, by this time, a lot of Jewish Christians were still going to synagogue and going to the Christian gatherings. And when they were discovered they were Christian, they would get thrown out of the synagogues. They were getting thrown out of the synagogues. It was very common happenstance in those days. Later in the first century, Jewish Christians were getting thrown out of the synagogue. And what Jesus is telling them in, by this thing is the Jewish leadership doesn't decide who's in the Christian community and who's not. They might decide who's in the synagogue or not. They don't get to decide who's in the Christian community or not. Y'all do. And y'all need to do it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So what that means is, who did Jesus accept? Everybody. He accepted everybody. Now, we all know he didn't leave them alone. There's nobody that came through the door into Jesus' circle that he didn't change in some way or another. A lot of us came into Jesus' circle of influence, and we were a mess in one way or another. Some of us were multiple messes all at once. But Jesus accepted us, and then he went to work on us, and he changed us. He didn't tell anybody they could not be a part of the coming kingdom of God. He didn't want them telling anybody they could not come into the church. He wanted them to make it open for all. However, if people came into the church and did like what some of the people in Corinth did, and they were not living according to the way church people should live. They weren't treating each other right. They weren't doing the next right thing. Obviously not in an obvious sort of way. Then that's where you have to call them in on the carpet. Like Matthew told us the, the prescription for dealing with church contention. One-on-one, -on -one, then three together, and then before the whole church. Remember, that was the, the recipe for how you deal with those things. But over the course of centuries, this if you forgive, they're forgiven. If you don't, they're not. has been used and abused in ways that I don't think Jesus intended. He meant to communicate to them that you can't get kicked out of the Christian church doing the right things. Just because the Jews kick you out of the synagogue doesn't mean they can kick you out of the Christian church. Because this was relevant in the day so as modern christians we want to be careful when we read verses like that that we don't think that we're supposed to be judges about forgiving or not forgiving we sure enough should forgive people if they show contriteness they confess and they repent and they they ask for forgiveness and they do their part to turn from what they did 
they try to make amends to us for the harm they caused us, or they accept our apologies back. We have to work with each other for this loving our brothers and sisters forgiveness part. But the true forgiveness comes from God that Jesus provided. You kind of can't have this if you don't have this. And if you have this, you need to allow for this. Jesus is telling them, this is part of who you are. Forgiving. Leading people into church, allowing them in. But you also got to keep the church pure. You can't allow things to come in and blast and bust up the church. You've got to keep it whole and following Jesus. That doesn't mean we have to be perfect friends. It just means we have to be aware of what we're doing. And if one of us makes a mistake, we have to admit it. If we're being truly honest with ourselves, there's times when we need to admit what we did was wrong. What we did wasn't quite the right thing to do. Maybe we made a bad decision. Well, just own it. Just own it. Ask for forgiveness. Make an effort to repent and go on. Because we all make those mistakes. None of us are pretending to be perfect, but we need to make allowances for each other in that. Jesus is telling them, I know y'all abandoned me. And I know y'all think I abandoned you when I was killed on the cross. But I didn't abandon you, as you can see, because here I am. I told you. I told you I'd be raised on the third day. Oh, today's the third day. Here I am. He did exactly what he told them. Everything he told them would happen, happened. And he's telling them, in not so many words, I forgive you for your lack of faith, for you're not getting it when I told you I had to be killed, I had to be turned over, but I would rise again. I forgive you for your lack of faith. And I forgive you for hiding right now. He told them all that the first night, and then he leaves. Comes back a week later, guess what? Where'd he find them? Same place. Same place. He, he told them to go and do, and what they do? They stayed and hid. This double, them staying where they were, speaks to how sometimes we are. We come into our church. This is safe space, right? Don't we all consider church here a safe space? We come into our safe space. Whew, I'm safe here. I can admit to being a Christian here. I can sing praises here. I can pray here. I can read the Bible here. I can laugh, Jesus, tell Jesus jokes in here. I don't necessarily feel so safe doing that out there. So what do we do? We stay in our locked little room. Now, for our benefit, I put in request to Jesus if he comes back to come back either 6 p.m. on a Saturday or 9.30 on Sunday because he'll find us right here <laughs> in our safe space. And he's probably going to walk in and go, uh-huh. Because he already knows. What do we do during the rest of the week? Jesus is telling us he forgives us when we don't believe as we should, maybe. Or we have those little doubts. We don't have the full-on conviction all the time. Something happens to upset us a little bit. And we have those little doubts. Or we don't represent when we have opportunities to. Jesus tells them, I forgive you. I still give you my peace. I still love you. God still loves you. I died for you and I would do it again, but I don't have to. Now go. So what's holding us back? We know it was holding back Thomas. He said, I'm not believing until I see and as soon as he saw he was done, he was good. Do y'all know the story of Thomas? Y'all know what he did after all this? He went to India. St. Thomas. He, he was the big evangelist. He went to India. He's still famous. St. Thomas is famous in India as the Christian among the Christian churches there. He's famous. Thomas went to the far end, what he was known then. Everybody else is going up through the Asia Minor over to Rome. He went the other direction. He went where nobody else was going. Do we go? When nobody else goes. When we relate to Thomas, how much do we relate to Thomas? 
Who was right enough to go find out what Thomas Winton did after all this? I don't know. But friends, this week, think about what's holding you back from being all the Christian you can be in light of the cross and the resurrection. We're in Easter. We are in Easter. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good afternoon, church. I want you to know that uh, my heart is heavy right now because there are members in our church who are experiencing difficult times. And so we need to keep them in a prayer and let me give you an example of who they are. First, we have Cheryl and her sister. Their mom passed about two weeks ago and they have now scheduled a memorial service that will be April 24th. It's going to be here at Grace Westland there in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock. And Pastor Myron will be officiating. Our brother David, uh, we need prayer for traveling mercies because David is on his way to see his brother. Remember we talked about his brother Rick. Well, his brother Rick has now been transported to hospice. He hasn't eaten in a week. And those of us who have experienced death and dying know that when they get to that point, we know the time is short. At the same time, our sister Joyce she was here earlier, but had to leave because our best friend, Don, he too is dying and has been assigned to hospice care. So when we have our brothers and sisters who are going through difficult periods of time like these, I think we all hurt and we all lift them up in prayer and ask God to provide them with comfort. Arlene Griffith is reported to be in the hospital, uh, possibly going to have uh, heart surgery. Don't know quite yet what that uh, entails. Kathy Jacob has a friend whose name is Amber Gray. She has had a hernia on her spleen. The doctors don't know right now what to do or what caused it. However, we know that if that uh, hernia burst, it will then cause and rupture her spleen. And that certainly will not be a good thing. Ricardo Walker, we need to pray for traveling mercies for his wife who's traveling out of town. Now Ricardo, some of you may not know, he works as, he's a technician that comes on Sundays, usually, works back there. And he also mentioned a friend of theirs, a co-worker, the wife of a co-worker named Lillian, who's very sick. Doctors are not sure what's going on. She is losing weight rapidly and is vomiting profusely, whatever that is. 
somebody he thinks is probably leukemia. So we don't know yet. Last but not least, next weekend, we won't be here. At least myself and Myron and who else? And the four gentlemen in our church that will be going on the walk to Emmaus. Freddie, Lewis, and Gary. And then Ricardo, I mentioned earlier, will be going uh, as well. So that's four. Uh, we were at the last meeting of the Emmaus team this morning, and we learned that we have 14 men. That, that's good for us. However, there is 26 women on the next walk. And I see some people out there admiring and saying, so uh, inviting them to consider going on the next women's walk. And we hope you would, you would consider go, doing that. So folks, you know, it is difficult. It is really hard when we have friends, our friends, who are going through difficult times in their lives because when, when they hurt, we hurt. So please keep these folks that we mentioned in your prayers. Thank you. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, I take a deep breath now to take you in. Some of us, Father, our hearts are heavy because we know friends and members of our church who are going through difficult times. There are individuals who are near death. And all we could do, Father, is pray for peace and comfort for those that they will probably leave behind. Yes, you can do miracles and we can pray for miracles. But most importantly, I think, Father, the most important prayer that we can give for those in that situation is to pray for their souls. We pray, Father, that they knew and your son Jesus so that without a shadow of a doubt we will know that they will enter the gates of heaven and father we just pray for all the men who will be going on a walk to Emmaus we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and touch each one of them and they will have that opportunity to get to know you and the Son, Jesus Christ, much better. To know that they are loved by you. And so now, Father, we turn to you and we offer the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, Let's all stand and sing to worship you right there.
very simple words to worship you and live. time to worship you and live. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live. To worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship Jesus came to the upper room to get out of the way what was holding them back. He does the same for us every day. Meet him there. Let him meet you in those places where you wall yourself off. Let him help you break out of where you're at when you think you're protecting yourself. Let Jesus walk with you. Friends, go in peace.